Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Sandy Alnock and today I'm going to be painting in watercolor and talking about Moon Glow from Daniel Smith, the color, because Lamsing 6090 recently saw my palette video, which I'll link down below, and asked, I just recently bought Moon Glow. Would love to see you use that color in a tutorial, please, especially mixed in a more colorful painting context. Now, I don't know if this is all going to be more colorful in terms of painting context, but I've got a bunch of ideas on how you can use Moon Glow, a bunch of different paintings that I've done with it, and talk through them and show you some examples. One is going to be a full painting, the chimpanzee. The others are going to be small sketches of one of the paintings that I've done so you can see how those paintings came about and where I used the moon glow in them because sometimes it's not obvious when you're looking at a painting. All right, let's get started, shall we? Moon glow has been in my palette for probably almost since the beginning, if not from the very beginning. Really, really like this color for a number of reasons. One is the granulation. Another is the variance you can get from it, from a very soft color to something very, very dark. And this is a painting that I did of a scene in Rome. I, I had been there to visit, came home and painted this from one of my photos. And I love the softness of it. Just I splashed on color wet in wet. And I'm just going to do a little quick sketch. Literally, these are not rocket science, but I just wanted to show you the process for how I get those kinds of mixes. And this is yellow ochre with the moon glow. That's the only two colors that are in it. I use very soft color, really, really wet on the paper, and just let the colors bleed together in a lot of different places. Very soft wash at first, and then went in with denser color as I moved further into the painting. Uh, it's a lot of water management, so it's a good exercise to practice your water management to work wet in wet, but it's really valuable because you can get so many beautiful soft edges. And depending on how long you wait for the pigment to dry, it'll be softer or harder. And that's just a really fun thing to play with. I love the way that these two colors mix and make interesting browns for buildings, especially historical buildings like you get across Europe or if you're in a, a town that has stone buildings. This color combination is just lovely as you saw in the original painting. And even on a small sketch, it can have that feeling of being like a structure of some kind. And these two colors can be used in a lot of different things too. So you'll see it a little bit more in this video as well because it is one of my favorite combinations. Now, most of the time with granulating colors, and it's definitely the case with Moon Glow, you get granulation from it when you're using it for like a really thick kind of mixture. Once you start using it about a mid midway, not the really pale ones. And then if you're using it really thickly, like I'm using right now on dry paper, you can just get a hard edge. But when it's kind of dropped in wet in wet into something, but there's enough pigment to make it really thick on the paper, then you start getting some of that breakdown and it'll break down sometimes into blues and purples and greens and teals and all different kinds of things. And it's just magical because it does it on its own. You don't have to do anything once you figure out what that mix is. And this painting is available if you want to get a print of it over on my Fine Art America brand new account. Put a link in the doobly do. I talked about that in my previous video if you want to hear more about it. Now, this next painting currently resides in New Jersey, it was purchased by a wonderful buyer there. And I used the moon glow itself and some other colors as a crazy background. Just lots of color. I just wet the paper and wet the paint and let them go to town on each other. It was a lot of fun to paint this one. And it's a really easy process once you start thinking about negative painting. For some people, negative painting is mind blowing, but I'll link the reference photo for this one in the doobly-doo down below because you can paint this in all different kinds of ways, but this is by far the easiest. Slap some color on and leave the spaces where the snow is available 
like right where it's sitting on top of those little flower thingies. I don't know what kind of flowers they are, but they're, they're holding like little cups of snow. And then just start putting colors in the background and let some of the color be really thick and let some of it be very watery. And then you can tip the paper around. If you have it taped onto a board, you can tip the paper and let it run and let it roll around so that it will start to do some blending and running and you don't get really hard edges. You just get a really interesting mix. Now, while this is wet, if you were to drop in more water and do all kinds of crazy things, you could get all sorts of nutso with this. This is the kind of thickness that I was talking about that will get you some granulation. Now for the little snow cups, the little, little snowballs in there, I just used some very, very thin pigment and let things kind of run into the flowers because, you know, it's very loose, a super easy style to work with and then dried it uh, so that I could start working on the rest of the painting. There was some of the color running into the flower, into that snow area, but you know, it doesn't really matter. I lifted it with a brush and it worked just great. And then you can just put your stems in for the flowers. And I switched to a tiny brush so I could do the more delicate work of the flower itself. And then on the tippy top of each one of those little little bracts, I, I don't know what they're called, but on the top of each one of those little things, there were little flowerettes on them, etc. And so if you look at the photo reference, you'll kind of see what I mean. You can also, you know, in the background of it, you could even do this wet and wet, put in some other stems, that sort of thing. I put some in while mine was wet, but hadn't done that on the first one. You can kind of just see the loose flow that I got from this. If you need to add a little bit of gouache, you can do that. I did on some of those little tiny dots on the painting. I also use Moon Glow sometimes to darken hues and you can mix it with a lot of different colors. Test it out, of course, first to see if it's the color that you want. But I used a lot of Moon Glow in here to deepen the browns and the greens and to make the shadow on the pathway. I painted this one plein air couple of years ago in a park while I was with a whole bunch of friends we were all painting and it was just a lovely lovely day but as I was doing this sketch I remembered some of the pain that I had painting that painting because I made the same mistakes here as I did that day so some old dogs never do learn new tricks but I remember starting with some really bright colors and thinking hmm that's a little bit too garish it didn't look like the dirt that I was seeing in front of me because it was much more neutral in its color. So I decided I was going to use the Moon Glow because Moon Glow was going to work for shading as well as for the shadows on the road. And that meant I could use it in nice quantity here along with all of the, the dirt on the ground. So a lot of that dark brown was mixed with transparent red oxide and yellow ochre mixed with the Moon Glow. I put a little bit of it in that tree. I don't know that I used, used it in the original painting, but I put it in there since we're talking about Moon Glow today. And this was where I remembered making the same mistake when I had painted the painting and I had to do some fixing to make it happen, which was painting the trees in wet and wet while the background was still wet. So my trees got thicker than they actually were when I was painting on site and it did the same thing to me here. So yeah. I just, you know, can't seem to, to get those things into my head all the time, but there you go. Painting the uh, trees was done with Moon Glow mixed with the transparent red oxide. And it might have been at that time that I had burnt sienna in my palette, so it could be burnt sienna that I had used in the original painting. But I had a little bit of it mixed with the greens so that I could paint those trees in the distance. And the Moon Glow just desaturated them just enough. I used them much thinner in the original painting. You'll see it again in a minute. But, you know, for the purposes of this quick demo, you can kind of see how Moon Glow starts to play throughout the whole painting. When you start using some common colors throughout the painting, you start developing harmony. Instead of just using a single color, if I wanted to use that on the path or the shadow, and then I didn't use it anywhere else, the shadow would just feel like it stood out like a sore thumb. And even if to your eye, that thing, whatever you've put that one color into, looks like it's the only thing in the scene with that color, it's your job as an artist to hold your whole painting together. 
in some ways. And you can make choices to use shadow colors or to add a pop of a certain color in a few places so that it's not just that, that one random place with just that color in it. So here you can see how thick you can mix the moon glow into a scene and get really nice darks. I love having colors in my palette that do that so that I have other variations instead of using black. Shading with black just kills whatever the color is, but when you shade with a color, it just makes a huge difference in bringing everything together. So you can see those rocks had a lot of that. The path on the road has a lot of the moon glow in it. Looks a little more on the bluish side in that one. Now you can also use moon glow for trees. And I love in winter paintings, when you're doing trees in the distance, to use moon glow for a sky. Um, using, it, using it with yellow ochre, it makes it feel very cold but you get the sense that there's a whole line of trees back there without actually painting them. And I'll show you how I did that because it was like really simple to do. And I just sketched a few buildings in here. I'll change my mind along the way, warn you ahead of time if that uh, <laughs> triggers anybody. Oh my gosh, what is she doing? I was trying to just use up leftover paint that was sitting in the palette and the shadows on these buildings are going to be on the left hand side but for now I'm just going to put the main color of the buildings in and then work on the sky. So I had put the sky in originally with the yellow ochre and then just dropped that moon glow in along the top edges of all the buildings and just kind of let it dance around in the background so it became that line of trees. I didn't have to paint them, I didn't put any more detail into them, you don't always have to have little branches showing. Just something that's enough to say there's something back here can often be enough to, to really make the main focus the main focus because those trees are not a main part in this, but they're a scene setter and they also are going to help those white roofs look whiter. They're going to look brighter because of having some more color behind them than just that yellow ochre. So on this painting, since I had the moon glow in those trees, I had to use it somewhere else. So I did put it onto some of the buildings so that I could have a little bit of that color. The shadow that I used for that one, the shadow color on the snow, was actually using the um, uh, Payne's Blue Gray that's in my palette. And that's another color that I use often for snow and for shading things too. Here I was just trying to decide what I was going to do with some of these buildings. They were all looking very too mu very much too much the same. So adapted that. But this was the basic technique that I did for the snowy path was to, you know, put the road and the side of the road in there and then add shadows from the buildings going across the street and then a implied shadow from a tree that you can't see off to the right so that there's something else of interest in the foreground. Whenever I'm painting snow, I really like to add some pops of dark colors. And the reason is because that allows me to put more color into the snow because there's really darks to bounce off of. Because once you start having these really dark shadows, the dark windows, the dark doors and chimneys in the building, you have more room to explore with some shadows in the snow. So you can get deeper, you know, deeper little tire marks and stuff for in the snow, deeper shadows in certain areas. And you can't do that if there's not something else dark, whether it's buildings or trees or something else that's in the scene. So make sure you transfer your photograph re reference, whatever, into black and white so that you can actually see what the values are and what they need to be and look for those really dark things that you can add a pop of dark color to. And one of the ways that I do that when I'm painting plein air, this was not done plein air, it was done from a photo, but if I'm doing it plein air, I'll take a picture of what I'm painting and then turn it black and white on my phone so I can still see it. I don't have to be in the studio having a computer handy or anything like that. But this is the original painting and you can see how nice those trees are in the background and then those shadows on the buildings tie all that together. It doesn't necessarily look completely like the moon glow, it, it just looks like it's, you know, muddy browns, that sort of thing. But it makes a big difference to tie all your colors together. 
So here is the finished four paintings, these little four sketches. And I will post these on my blog along with the original paintings. And some of them are on my Fine Art America. And if there's ever anything that you see me paint that you're like, I need a print of that, or I need to make a pillow of that or whatever, just let me know because I can add as much as I want into that shop. If you wish to purchase something, I only get, you know, like a, a couple of bucks for each one. Most of the money that you're paying for prints from Fine Art America are the, the dollars that are going to them so that they can actually uh, make the things and send it to you. So they just send me a small percentage of it. But I know it helps people to be able to have something in their hands that they can look at and be inspired by. Now we are going to get back to that chimpanzee, but I have a couple other examples using Moonglow. This was Moonglow with yellow ochre and a little bit of transparent red oxide for the, the hair. This one has Moonglow in the background. I used it practically solid-ish. It was very, very dark. This is in the um, watercolor bouquets class. This was a pen and ink drawing and I used a French ultramarine blue with moon glow to watercolor over top of the pen and ink. And this was another rabbit that has moon glow in the rabbit and in the ground. And there's a little bit of moon glow in the background and it's got more than the yellow ochre. It's got some new gamboge and stuff in the background too. This one has a mixed purple so that I could have something that was more reddish, but some of those colors in there are also moon glow. This one you can obviously see it's moon glow and yellow ochre and the two colors just play beautifully together. Those sorts of things. Uh, the, the Aurora Borealis there was just done by flooding the paper with water and just letting the color run, which was lots of fun. And this one was using moon glow mixed with other colors to make those buildings recede into the distance because I wanted the water to be the really bright thing. And then these were sheep that were done with yellow ochre and moon glow. I know the original request was for colorful paintings with moon glow in them, but moon glow is not a bright, colorful color. So it's not necessarily going to give you that kind of brightness, but you can use it in certain contexts with other things that you're painting. So let's look at the chimp that I did just for this video. The background behind the chimp. I just kind of painted a whole bunch of greens in there and just let it kind of go crazy. I wanted it to be soft and feel like bokeh, but not with dots in it. I just wanted it to feel very blurry in the distance. Sprayed it a bit just to keep the color moving, threw in more color, and then I got some really thick, thick, thick moon glow and made a branch, a couple of dots of dark areas, because the photo reference that I had just had this kind of mush in the background. And I wanted that feeling. And painting it upside down like this gave me the ability to let that color move upward instead of move down into the chimp because I wanted the top edge of the chimp to be on the soft side. Now, another thing Moon Glow does is give you a neutral color that you can use for something like a chimp without it being a black. Because, you know, a, a black painting, a gray painting can feel a little bit on the dead side. And Moon Glow will allow you to have a little more flexibility. You can add some black into it, which I will do. But I didn't add a ton of it, so I wanted some of that Moon Glow to show through. And, you know, my photos and everything look purpler than it is, because when it dries, it's a little more on the gray side. Like I said, it's desaturated. And I'm also mixing it periodically with transparent red oxide, or you could do the same thing with burnt sienna. Here's where I'm introducing a little bit of black into the painting. Just the parts that I really want to focus the viewer's eye on, I want to have some of that black in. I want to pull them into the eyes. The eyes are kind of under an overhang in the photograph with the eyebrows just kind of really hanging down heavy. I lightened it up some because I wasn't sure I wanted to go for that serious of a look. I wanted to see what his expression was by the time I finished, but putting the black in the nostrils and right around the eyes gives you that focus. Then I can go back to using various amounts of the moon glow in order to make the other shadows. Even in the ears, I 
put more moon glow and a little bit more of the transparent red oxide, just dropping in a few dollops of the black for a really strong contrast because I didn't want black to be everywhere and to dominate the painting. And then I started using the black and moon glow together in making some of the delicate hairs on the side of the face. And I wasn't really sure how I was liking this. So I, I proceeded with it knowing that there's some things that I could do to it once I got it to a certain point. It, it needed to have that, that detail underneath. I didn't like the detail on top because it just gets so fussy that your eye wants to go to all of that fur instead of to the eyes. Same thing was happening with the little chinny chin hairs that he has. So a couple of times you'll see me just kind of go over some of that hair work, that delicate stuff so that I could disguise it somewhat. I would be better off if I could learn when to stop putting detail in, but I am a fusser and I, you know, just kept trying to put in more of those little tiny bits of hairs and uh, yeah, kept kind of driving myself nuts because I, I would then have to come back from that step back. But that's one of the joys of watercolor is that you can keep working at it a little bit at a time if you use very light layers. You just have to be willing to do some, you know, lightening up, you know, doing some lifting with a baby wipe, that sort of thing to get really pale color. But you can see that the color of the moon glow is acting more as a gray here than it is as a purple. So if you can stop thinking of your colors as a color, but think of it as a value, I'm using it as I would if I had just tried to water down a black to make this whole painting and make him an all gray little guy. I could have done that, but this was so much more fun and it's so much more lively because it has all this color in it. It does have all my fussy brush strokes, so I'll slow down on this next part just a little bit so you can see uh, some of the painting over everything that I ended up doing just kind of going over all the areas that I had gotten overly fussy with all of those brush strokes and brought the light just onto a little bit of the fingers and then knocked it back on a few areas of the face so that there were just certain areas that I'm drawing attention to because in any painting, any artwork, the place where you have the darkest darks next to the lightest lights, that's generally going to be where your focal point is. That's where people are going to look. And I wanted them to look at his eyes and his nose and his mouth, maybe a little bit of that ear that has such contrast with the sun coming in, and a little bit on the hand. And the rest of it just kind of goes all soft, that background and everything, it just disappears into the distance as if you're, you're on portrait mode in your camera and not getting really sharp details, but all that detail is in the face. So I hope this was helpful to understand moon glow. There's more pictures of all this stuff over on my blog if you want to examine any of those paintings closer. And I'll tell you which ones are on Fine Art America if you want prints. That's about it. I'll see you guys again in a couple days. Bye-bye.